Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We're counting down to the next VRIC January 21st and 22nd. There's a link in the description below where you can get your tickets. But for now, we're bringing the VRIC to you with our expert online panels. And we've got a great one today. It's Craig Hemke of the TF Metals Report and Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin Precious Metals. Two of my favorite people to talk to. It's great to have you both here. Thank you, Jesse. Good to see you, Andy. Yeah, yeah, it is. Good to see you both. Thanks for having so, me. So, yeah, great to have both of you here. Um, let's start with both your views on the economy and markets at present. We've seen a lot of turmoil in the world, a hot war between Israel and Hamas, the long-term bond market dropping to historic lows, U.S. politics being incredibly polarizing at present. The list goes on and on. What are the main themes and trends that you're currently watching at the moment? And Craig, I'll start with you. Well, uh, I've been watching the same theme and trends, it seems, for the last uh, year or so. Um, I write up an annual forecast every January, at least. If anything, it just gives me uh, an avenue to write what my current thoughts are and then hold myself accountable to it and see, you know, where I messed up. And I, you know, I was right in January. I thought, well, we'll probably make it about June or July. Then it'll be so obvious that the U.S. will be in recession, that the Fed will be pivoting and pausing. You know, there'll be all these liquidity concerns from higher interest rates. You know, kind of thinking we we're following the playbook out of 2018 uh, and years before that. Uh, hell, here we are in October and they're still playing these rhetorical games. And I mean, they're still pricing in a rate hike for January. And so I, like everybody else, I'm just exhausted by this. You know, I I think the inevitable economic contraction recession uh, is still coming. Well, that's what inevitable means, I guess. Um, it, it just keeps getting delayed. Now, once it comes, what you've seen in gold and silver is this kind of fear of missing out. I guess you could say it in the see it in the stock market too. Every time there's any hint that the Fed is done. You know, whether it's economic reasons, whether it's Fed speak, whether it's this war in the Middle East, man, the metals just take off because everybody figures, man, boy, as soon as they're done, they're going to start cutting. And I that day is coming when that all actually comes to fruition. You've you've seen the signs of it. But man, sitting here waiting for it, um, <laughs> it certainly aged me a couple of years this year. And Andy, what about yourself? What are you currently watching when it comes to the geopolitical landscape the broad economy and financial markets? Well, you know, I've kind of, I don't know if you've seen the new version of the little boy who cries wolf, but I'm on the cover. And, you know, <laughs> if you skip to the last page, you see the wolf comes. And yet, you know, um, I guess I'm, I'm beating the same drum I've been beating for a very long time. Uh, in terms of trends, I see, um, a large problem with the dollar and it retaining its global status as as the sole settlement currency for for petrol for oil. Uh, I see an environment where you know, look, the U.S. dollar's reserve status is given. Um, I guess you could say it's allowed the U.S. to get away with an awful lot, and I think it's also lulled a lot of Americans and a lot of the people pulling the strings into a false sense of security. Um, I think many people think that we can do whatever we want when it comes to borrowing and to spending. In August alone, the Biden administration spent over $527 billion. Um, it's added more than $450 billion in the last 18 days. And it took nearly 200 years to add our first $500 billion to, uh, to the debt. And I think that you could argue that, you know, all empires believe that their currency would be demanded eternally. And I am beginning to feel that the confidence around the world is beginning to wane. Now, I have focused for quite some time on the BRICS. I have focused for quite some time on, on this, this massive accumulation of gold by the most powerful players in the world, the central banks. And this is something that is continuing unabated. Um, in fact, over the last 18 months, they've bought more gold than at any time in history. And if you pay close attention, not only 
are at the same countries that are massively accumulating gold. They're the same countries that at the same time are simultaneously shedding their treasury positions. And they just happen to rhyme with ricks and bricks. And it's the countries on the east side of the ledger that are de-dollarizing, striking deals around the globe in, in local currencies. Um, and, and, and this is mostly centering, centering around energy. They're selling bonds and they're accumulating gold. And I think this is a trend that will not stop. In fact, one of my favorite terms is logarithmic decay, little by little by little by little by little, then bang, all at once. And I think you can see the little by little by little by little by little over the last three years. We haven't hit the all at once, haven't gone over the falls yet, but I think we're getting closer and closer to that moment and what's happening in the Middle East will only, I think, add fuel to that uh, to that fire. Well, let's expand on that conflict because I'm wondering what you think some of the potential implications of the Israel-Hamas conflict are on the gold and silver market. And particularly if we see other wars break out, you know, China invading Taiwan doesn't seem like such a distant possibility at this point in time. Um, how would that affect the precious metals markets as well? And um, Andy, I'll start with you on this one. Well, I mean, the obvious, right? Uncertainty, um, chaos, war. As, a, as you're talking about the Middle East, look, this could very quickly escalate into a regional war. I suspect it probably will. Um, you look at the countries that, you know, this is largely an OPEC, uh, Middle East style um, left versus right. You got the OPEC and the Arab countries mostly against the West, against Israel, against the United States and those countries that support it. You could see an OPEC style uh, embargo. You know, you got 20% of the world's oil as a choke point through the Straits of Hormuz. And, um, you know, Iran could easily halt the passage of tankers. And uh, you'd see a spike in energy prices. Uh, you'd see inflation start to take off again. Uh, you could see as a result of that, the Fed continuing to tighten instead of accommodating. Um, and you could see a, fin a financial market collapse, a banking market collapse. I think all of the problems are going to spring from the banks collapsing in this country. And we can get more into that. But, um, you know, one of the things that I've talked about ad nauseum about this thesis that I have is this little by little by little by little and then all at once, ultimately speaks of Saudi Arabia and OPEC saying, hey, thanks for the memories. You know, you guys are going green. You've signed an executive order to do so uh, by 2030, 50% by 2050, 80%. Uh, we have aligned not only with the Belt Road Initiative, where all the OPEC countries are, but the BRICS nations, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And what is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization? By the way, who I, Iran has also signed up with, and the BRICS, it is the largest regional military and financial organization on the planet. We've also joined the BRICS New Development Bank, and we told everyone in Davos that we're going to take other currencies for oil. And, you know, we're just not on the same side of things any longer. You're going green, and you're supporting a war that we are really at odds with. So us, all of the brothers and sisters in, in the OPEC nations have decided to stop taking dollars for oil as a result of this war and many other things. And bang, there is your all at once moment. When the dollar is globally forsaken, it is dumped in unison. And that inflation uh, of all that excess currency coming across the globe creates havoc in the Western markets. The byproduct of that would be, would be massively spiked interest rates. It's that Klaus Schwab moment where stocks, bonds, and real estate are inversely correlated to a spike in interest rates. And, and you know, when I, and I don't mean to monopolize here, I'll, I'll stop in one second. When I think about all of this stuff, when you realize that the number one economic advisor to the United States government is a man named Jared Bernstein who wants to lose the dollar's world reserve status. And everything we are doing from weaponizing the dollar to signing executive order that we are going green to continually um, meddling and, 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 and coercing and, and destroying the value of the dollar through the printing press would lead, I think, most nations to say, why are we taking the dollar 
um, for oil. Why don't we take other things? And I think that's ultimately the worst possible outcome we could see as these these um, these these conflicts increase and increase with consequences as well. And Craig, your thoughts on how both this conflict in the Middle East and poten- potential emergence of further global conflict could affect the precious metals market? You know, my friend Andy summed it up pretty well. I mean, there's not a whole lot more to add. I I, I was just, as he was speaking, I was thinking about what would you do if you were Jerry Powell? I mean, I remember, remember when he uh, put himself in to do it a second time? Yeah, I remember like who Biden renominated him a couple of years ago. I thought, what kind of lunatic? One, you got to become kind of megalomaniac to want that job in the first place. Why would you sign up to do it again, knowing all that you know, right? I mean, he could have just sailed off in the sunset, worked for Citadel, and given million dollar speeches. Instead, he, I mean, you got to really uh, think highly of yourself. Be believe all your news clippings that you're some kind of omnipotent demigod. Uh, to actually want that job. So, I mean, he is now faced with myriad uh, issues that he's got to manage. And I, I, I'm still in the camp that, you know, when push comes to shove, uh, all of their job owning, all of their little rate hikes and everything else get thrown out the window. Um, They will serve their masters, the, the primary dealer banks uh, that, you know, that own them and they will serve them first. Um, we've already seen uh, last week, there was, what was it? The 20 year treasury that almost had a failed auction and the primary dealers had to soak up like 18% of it here. It's yours. That's their job as a primary dealer, right? These big banks, they have to make a market. And when an auction doesn't get fully subscribed, they got to buy it. Um, Hey, that, you know, that's all part of the fun. That's why you get that job and that power, but that's, so there are, so many signs of stress within the banking sector that I think, again, I this is what they've done time and again in the last 15 years since the paradigm changed with the financial crisis. And I just suspect they'll do it again. Ultimately, given that we're at the end of this Keynesian experiment where the math is just exploding to the upside, I think it leads to some form of yield curve control where the Fed just simply puts in a, a put and says, we will just, you know, it's like the London gold pool. Anytime yields exceed 3% of the 10 year, we are the buyer and we will cap it. And unlike the Bank of Japan, we could give a shit. We're just going to keep on doing it. Um, I think that's where it's headed. That enshrines uh, sharply negative real interest rates. You know, all of this leads to much higher gold prices uh, in the end. And, I, I again, I may I'm just a simple guy out here in the middle of nowhere, but I just don't see how any of this is avoidable. Jesse, can I add to what Craig said real quick? Because he said a few things that I completely agree with. First of all, um, the, the number two economic advisor to the U.S. government is a lady named Lael Brainerd, and Lael ran against Powell when she when he went yeah. up for reappointment. She went from the Treasury to the Fed, and now she's the number two economic advisor at. Uh, the White House, uh, her whole theory, she's a modern monetary theorist. She ran point on Fed now, which just came out, which is Fed's version of Venmo, which will replace all checks within a year. She also, while she was at the Fed, worked with MIT in Biden's fast tracking and executive order of the new central bank digital currency, which, which the Bank of International Settlement said every country must have one operational by 2025. Um, she would like to see the banks fail. I believe she wants to see the banks be culled into uh, just a handful of banks so that they are able to roll out their their CBDC. And so I just want to make it clear on one thing. What Craig is saying, I believe, is the logical path. And he'll probably be right, probably more so than what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. You got two economic advisors. One wants to lose the world reserve status and one openly, openly advocates for a central bank digital currency, a culling of the banks. And, and um, if you look at the, 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 the decisions that are being made uh, by weaponizing the currency, by saying we're going green, well, geez, that certainly would be the first two things you would do to lo- lose the world reserve status. 
And by allowing the overnight reverse repo market to take in all of the money market funds, well, that's sucking all the money out of the regional banks. And then you can see all the money being sucked out of the commercial banks going directly to the treasury, uh, which is now pulling all the money out of the repo market, which will immediately create a recession and slow the economy down uh, because these businesses will have no liquidity. My point is this, the decisions that are being made and are being allowed are aiding and abetting the destruction, not only of the dollar, but of the banking system. And why would they do that? Well, there are two reasons. Number one, they have a villain. It was Xi Jinping, Putin, and OPEC. Those bastards, they did it to us. And number two, we are a country that has $150 trillion in, in debt with, with $5 trillion in assets, according to the 2022 balance sheet, the biggest asset being student debt of over 40%. We're 130% debt to GDP, and there has never been a country in history that has crossed that Rubicon that hasn't in some way defaulted. Well, now you got a villain. Those bastards, they did it to us. Those When they said it was Putin's inflation, I said, my God, they're looking for a villain. They're going to blame it on them. And, and the idiocy of the things that we are doing, the stupidity, whether it be here domestically or around the globe, either our leaders are completely inept and completely stupid, or in my opinion, they're trying to reset the system, blow everything up and say, have no fear, because Lael Brainerd is here with her central bank digital currency. Just sign on the dotted line and all that money you just lost in the banks that were bailed in. Do you know I've gone out to dinner and lunch? for three days in a row with people and they're all successful business people. And I say, do you know what a bail-in is? And not one of them knows what it is, yet it's <laughs> written into law. Can you imagine if a PNC or a Schwab or one of these banks blows up like that and is bailed in and everyone loses their mind? What happens to rates as banks panic and they go higher and everyone sells and everyone gives me back my money and rates go. We're at a point in time when Craig mentioned so much stress where this could go either way very, very, very quickly. And I just wonder, is this intended? Or are our leaders that stupid to think the actions they take will not have consequences? That's just my two cents and I can't shake it. But what Craig says is the logical approach. I'm out there, but I can't get <laughs> it out of my mind no matter how much I think about it or what angles I look at it from. Quick announcement, on January 21st and 22nd, we're hosting the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference, our flagship event. But first, we're doing a sneak peek conference right here on this YouTube channel. On November 7th, we're gonna be joined by a handful of our keynote speakers who will be sharing their top stock picks. Individuals like Tavi Costa, Gwen Preston, Jeff Clark, Adrian Day, Nick Hodge, Willem Middlecoop, myself, and many others. Don't miss the pre-VRIC Summit right here on the VRIC YouTube channel, November 7th. No, I think that makes a, a lot of sense. And yeah, Craig, I'd like to get a follow-up from you because, you know, ever since we go back to 1913, the formation of the Federal Reserve, a lot of this chicanery has been happening, decisions being made to benefit a small cartel. Um, I recently interviewed G. Edward Griffin, who wrote um, The Creature from Jekyll Island. And that's a book that kind of got me started on the journey to to realizing all these things. Andy, you said the people you're with don't know what a bail-in is. That's most people out there. And I was among them. It took the pandemic to hit to kind of wake me up to wait a minute. My, maybe I should start thinking about what my government's doing and made me go down the rabbit hole. But as Andy was touching on, you know, the governments are doing and, and the central banks doing incredibly irresponsible things, funding foreign wars, projects that go nowhere, debt levels completely out of control. So to Andy's point, are these people just complete idiots? Are they just trying to benefit themselves, like thinking of their own survival? Or is this part of a grander plan to crush the economy and make people more reliant on the government? So, Craig, what are your thoughts there? Uh, of those three options, I'm probably more in line with the first two. And it kind of gets back to this kind of recency bias, uh, that people normalcy bias that people have too. like, like Andy said, what, what's it, these friends say, what's a bail in, right? Uh, you know, people don't know a world where the dollar isn't the reserve currency, you know? And so there's this normalcy bias that, this is, you know, tomorrow's always going to be like yesterday. And then you throw on the fact that, yeah, the politicians are inept 
uh, and all self, you know, they're all self-serving all the way through uh, the Federal Reserve, right? All these, you know, whether it's the politicians buying stocks, you know, in Raytheon one week before the war starts, you know, stuff like that, or all these these goons from the Fed that just grab any mic that's put in front of them all in the hopes that one day, you know, they can go into the private sector and work for a Citadel or some hedge fund, BlackRock, whatever, and make all cash out. Um, and so all of that, I think, is rather than some grand scheme, I, I'm, I'm more in line with just these people are just buffoons that think that uh, this thing will perpetuate itself forever. I, you know, and I, I, I might spin this off in a different direction in that, I continue to see, I saw it yesterday, um, I don't know, and then again this morning, doesn't really matter what the days are, of, of people who can't, can't figure out why is it that by all historical measures, real rates and things like that indicate gold should be $1,000, not 2000 Why hasn't it gone down? And people, you know, scratching their beards and rubbing their heads and they you know, all this, I can't figure it out. Well, I think it's all really, I mean, clear. If you want, if you understand the gold market, but it's also really clear what's going on. We are in a paradigm shifting period. And, as, you know, yeah, there's this fear of missing out and everything else. But people are looking forward and going, OK, yeah, sure. The, you know, the Fed is doing this and blah, 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 blah. But I'm not selling gold. I'm not selling my gold futures. I'm not getting short. I'm not doing any of that stuff because I can see where this stuff is headed. And so I, I, whether it's by design or not, I mean, again, so much of it is an eventuality anyway. The, the role of gold and silver in this kind of environment, um, you know, we've been talking about this for a dozen years now, but it just gets more relevant every single day. Um, and for people that haven't really thought about the historic role of physical precious metal and what it does for your, not so much capital gains, but just for your financial protection. People haven't even begun, you know, vast majority of people haven't begun to think about that kind of stuff yet, but they need to because everything is kind of hurtling in this direction where, um, you know, there's just kind of this economic and geopolitical madness coming over the horizon. And man, if you can get your hands on some physical metal, call up Miles Franklin. Uh, they'll ship it right to your door, man. Um, I would, I, if you don't have any, you better get some as soon as you can. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing that it was yesterday in the span of human history when the dollar was taken off of gold backing. And yet yeah. nobody, even most people, if you ask them probably don't know that that ever happened. Yeah. You, they still you, think you that's say, the Do case. you think gold was ever used as money in the U S they, or, or they would be like, yeah, maybe like thousands of years ago or, you know, back, you know, they think it's like pirate treasure. They have no idea. It's, right. it's, it's sad, but I think more people are starting to wake up. Um, so Andy, I'd like to turn to you on your current thoughts on the gold market and any catalyst you think could send gold back, uh, gold up to new all-time highs. Well, you look around and you see um, warehouse uh, holdings on COMEX and London Metals Exchange, even the Shanghai Gold exchange or even backdooring out of the global ETFs, they are falling sharply. Um, you're seeing deliveries, in other words, off of these exchanges or exchange for physical outflows every single week. What that tells me is that you're dealing with the most sophisticated traders on the planet. It would be much easier for, for people to write me a, a check or send me a wire for $50 million and buy gold and silver that I could deliver then it would be to try and take $50 million in delivery off of COMEX or the LBMA, which is not an easy thing to do. This speaks not only to great wealth, but great sophistication and inside knowledge, in my opinion. We are witnessing a period of time where the central banks are continuing to stockpile gold at, at a record pace. And, you know, the first half of 2023 saw a continuation of the trend we saw in 2022, which were the largest purchases of central banks in, in more than 70 years, and if not ever. The last 18 months, more than ever. And you're seeing the majority of the, the gold that is being purchased a striking overlap, if you will, with the BRICS countries, where four of the five BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, are buying a cumulative almost 3,000 tons of gold over the last 12 years. And that's just by 
reported statements. And at the same time, these are the countries that are selling their treasuries, I might add. We're also seeing things, people want to say, well, it's because of shortages of gold in China. I say, no, it's not. I say it's because they are beginning to see um, how arbitrage could affect um, their accumulation of gold. For the last couple of weeks, gold has been priced as much as $120 an ounce higher in Shanghai than it has been on the London Metals Exchange or the Colmex. And come up with any idea that you want why this is happening, and I'll say I don't believe it. It is that they are waking up to the fact that if they just slowly let the price rise there, they will suck the majority of the gold and silver off the globe as traders rush to arbitrage it. And I think the bottom line is simply this, that... Um, the big, big sophisticated money, you know, the central banks and the commercial banks, they are using the suppression of the Western market to run cover for their overt um, accumulation and repatriation. And at the same time, I think as we continue to see how the, and Craig has, has, has documented the goings-ons of the COMEX market as well as anyone for years. And, and if anyone knows the shenanigans that go on on Comex, it's him. It's maddening, right? It's enough to make you pull the damn hair out of your head because it's so counterintuitive. And these stupid brain dead managed money traders get sucked in every time to the commercial banks who then smack the price. The options expire worthless and they do it over and over and over again. In fact, right now could be one of those times or maybe not. Right now we have the commercial banks net long or very close to it in silver and very close to it in gold, what happens if one of these times they just let it run and crush the managed money who try and cover naked short positions where there just isn't enough physical metal on the exchanges to cover those positions without the price going to the moon? I guess the bottom line is simply this. I believe that we will see at some point a, a, um, uh, a growing unity between the Shanghai um, gold exchange between the Moscow Metals Exchange and other players on that side of the globe who say, in fact, when the Moscow Metal Exchange came up, they said this is being done because the West is a bunch of lying fools and they're lying about the price. It's rehypothecated. No one has talked about the London Metals or the London Gold Pool more articulately than, than Craig. He understands the manipulation of the gold market as much as anyone in this industry. He'll echo this. I know that. That the markets are manipulated. The gold markets are. And I think the people accumulating it know that. And the only reason they're not bitching is because they're sucking it all out of the system using our own manipulation against us. But once they've sucked as much out as they possibly can, now they've raised the spot price a bit, suck some more, raise it some more. Watch what happens. They'll suck some more. And when no longer the, the BS price that, of the Western system is accepted for reality, you will see these countries join together in a new system, a new um, pricing mechanism that will, I believe, supplant the the the, the lying, uh, rehypothecated, manipulated LBMA COMEX price setting system. So what do I see as a driver? I see little by little by little by little and bang all at once. Once again, logarithmic decay. It's being sucked out of the exchanges little by little by little by little and bang. We will wake up and we will see prices so damn high, you don't even know what hits you and it'll happen on a Sunday night or a Monday morning and you won't be able to find any. And very close after that, we will see the pricing system move eastward and the Western price um, leveraged price system where the tail is wagging the dog will be rendered, I believe, as a scam and will be rendered obsolete. Here again, I'm thinking out into the future, but that is the catalyst to me because we don't understand gold and the rest of the world who is voraciously accumulating it has a damn good idea that he who has the gold makes the rules, as the old adage goes. So I'd love to hear Craig's take on this because, Craig, no one understands the goings-on of the manipulation of the markets quite the way that you do. I'd love to hear your take on it. Well, thank, thank you, Andy. I, Jesse, if I may, I want to – this kind of opens the door to allow me to double back to what I was talking about a few minutes ago with all these traditional analysts scratching their beards and rubbing their heads, trying to figure out why at this level of real rates and nominal rates, the, the long-term correlation between gold prices and real rates has broken down. I mean, a lot of people probably seen these charts, you know, I mean, they track and they track and they track until about a year and a half ago. And now 
the the implied price from where real interest rates are places gold like at eleven hundred dollars an ounce. We're like, what's going on? Why did this break? And everybody's looking at all these, you know, academic reasons. Let me tell you why. Okay, this is I could be wrong, but to me, it's pretty obvious. As Andy described, we have a derivative based pricing scheme, right? The price that the futures tail wags the spot dog, as Ned Naylor Leyland famously said a dozen years ago. And so you trade these derivatives to determine the physical price. Now, the only way, you know, you might as well be trading baseball cards. The only way that that derivative price has any significance and relevance is if you can deliver physical metal at that price. You can say all you want, the price is X, but if the physical commodity doesn't actually trade at that price, then it's just BS. I mean, you can say whatever you want about it, okay? The banks know, as Andy rattled off, the central go- central bank gold demand, you know, the de- declining physical stockpiles around the world and all this kind of stuff. The banks who are in charge of setting and managing this derivative price through London and New York, they know that if price, you know, their derivative price were to track real interest rates down to $1,200, there'd be no physical metal to flow to that price. I mean, they're the ones that have to be able to flywheel it out of the GLD, you know, and come up with it from all these different sources, borrow it from the, you know, the King of England or whatever to try to, you know, all of a sudden here come, you know, if they allow the derivatives to show a price of 1400 and all these central banks and institutions, everybody else shows up in London wanting gold for $1,400 an ounce, they got to come up with it. And from where are they going to get it to fill those orders? And that is why there's this big yawning gap between where gold should be relative historically to real interest rates and where it is now. Now, there's other factors, like I said, fear missing out, waiting for, you know, all this geopolitical stuff, waiting for a Fed pause and all that kind of stuff. But people that look at that chart and can't figure out why in the heck is gold not $800 cheaper? Well, that's why. Because the physical metal that underpins the derivative pricing scheme just isn't there anymore. And it's it's really no more complicated than that. So anyway, I wasn't going to, you know, take five minutes going into that, but my friend Andy opened the door. So I thought I'd just walk right through it. I firmly, I could be dead wrong. Look, I'm not, look, I'm just this guy out here in the middle of nowhere. But in all of my years of watching this stuff and analyzing it and trying to understand it, that is to me the obvious answer. Well, I'd like to hone in on silver specifically to wrap things up because unlike gold, it's nowhere near its all-time highs. Andy, you've said this presents a generational opportunity. It's funny that whenever I post videos about silver here and and on my own channel as well, the comments are just unrelentingly negative um, these days, saying silver's done nothing, worst investment I ever made. Um, I I think a lot of people don't look at it the right way. They see it as something they hope is going to go to the moon. And I think the... uh, the whole silver squeeze movement kind of exacerbated that, the idea that these retail investors were going to all get together and somehow create a Hunt Brothers type of moment. Um, but Andy, I'll go to you first on this. What what do you see currently in the silver market in terms of the opportunity it presents? And what what's your response to, to the naysayers? Well, first of all, you said it right. I mean, and that's the people that came on on the heels of GameStop and, and AMC were doing it for the wrong reasons. You know, I started my company 33 years ago with my father, I was 19, he said, you'll buy gold and silver every two weeks or I'll fire you, that's the only rule, period. Cool, I can do that. I've owned the company outright for two decades. I have never um, not honored my promise to my father. Every two weeks for almost 34 years, I have bought something, never missed a two week period ever. To me, that's wealth. And I don't care if it goes up or it goes down. I'm very aware of it, but to me, it is my wealth that I hope I never need to use. If I do, not just for an emergency, maybe an opportunity. I'm damn glad I have it. If not, it goes to my kid. It is my my kids. It is my wealth, period. And the, the people that came on, mostly younger people, figured, oh, we'll, we'll crush the gold market just like we did AMC and GameStop. And then when they realized that this is a market that they didn't understand, that they didn't spend the time researching or understand the reasons to own it or who owns it or why they own it, I think that they have become certainly disenchanted with its its ups and downs and its price movements. I get it. I've been at this for over three decades, and it still bums me out when I see how stupid the pricing is. 
and how counterintuitive it is. But when you talk about an asset that is massively depleting in nature, you know, your skin is called epidermis. Silver is found in nature in a form called epithermal, very near the top of the surface of the, the ground. And big deposits were found decades ago. This is a, a, a asset or a commodity that was coming out of the ground at a relationship to gold of 16 to one for 5,000 years. But uh, my buddy Keith Newmeyer will tell you, he says it all over the place. It's now coming out of the ground. It's seven to one. It is depleting in nature. And, and yet it's, it's utility. You know, people talk about its utility uh, in green and, and, and um, uh, um, digital applications. Great. How about military applications? There's 500 ounces in the tip of a Tomahawk cruise missile. All of these advanced weaponry systems have silver in them. And if you haven't noticed, there's quite a bit of them flying through the air these days, unfortunately. The need in military applications, the need in green applications, the need in digital applications, not to mention an asset that has experienced a monetary renaissance in the last three years to the point where the majority of all the business we've done record year after year after year, 2020, 2021, 2022, and this year, record, better than the last. Most of it is in silver. The demand for silver is off the charts. I mean, you got Ted Butler saying it's disappearing off the exchanges. You got India importing 304 million ounces last year. You see the Shanghai Metals Exchange, biggest one day uh, outflow ever a few weeks ago to the lowest level they've ever had. You've got the London Metals Exchange saying if we keep seeing outflows like this, there'll be none left. You have a situation where the real price right now at nearly 80 to one is so distorted from what it's coming out of the ground at, at seven to one. In an asset that has uh, duality, if not uh, three times demand in terms of military, green, digital, and monetary, four demand sources, and an asset that is depleting in nature, um, that, you know, once you use it, it's gone forever and landfills are blown up in bombs. This is a, when you talk about an asset that should be going to the moon, and I'll let Craig answer this question because I can't, I mean, there's no other way to explain how the hell does a bank like Bank of America make it short a billion ounces? How the hell are there four or five or six banks on Comex that represent the most significantly um, uh, and, and the largest concentrated short position of any commodity traded on the exchange? They are holding it down. They are holding it down at the same time the smart money is accumulating the hell out of it and draining the exchanges. Now, that potential that everyone is looking for will happen all at once. The little by little by little by little is happening. The draining, the accumulation, it is happening. The price suppression, it is happening. And then all at once we'll wake up to a new reality. And I don't know when it is, but be damn sure that's exactly what you want to see or be careful what you wish for because when it happens it may not be the greatest environment for all those people who have who are wishing for that moment it, it probably will happen but if you own metals to get wealthy you're missing the point metals are wealth and you own enough of them you will be wealthy but buying them to get wealthy you're just asking to have gray hair and be very very disappointed with its reactions, because these banks are very good at shaking you from the tree if you're holding it for the wrong reasons. And I guess that would be my take on, on the naysayers. Yeah, absolutely agree with you there. It's funny, people scratch their heads when the topic of gold and silver comes up, people who, who aren't interested in that topic so much. And I tell them, I hope I never have to sell my gold and silver. My plan is to never sell. They cannot wrap their heads. Why would you own something that you're not? Because it is wealth itself, as you said. You put it very well. Look so the wealthy Craig, people, the wealthy people own assets, and that's what it is. Yes. It's, it's a wealth asset. Absolutely. And Craig, your thoughts on the current state of the silver market and where you see it headed? Well, Andy summed it up beautifully. Um, I would just the only thing I'd add is kind of turn it back to what I was mentioning a few minutes ago. Uh, the system is a fractional reserve and digital derivative pricing scheme. It is managed by banks. And in particular, in silver, it's managed by a handful of banks that do it for profit. I mean, they make this is, I mean, if you can if you have a monopolistic control over the pricing scheme, you can make a shit ton of money doing that. And they do on a consistent basis. You can watch it. Right? Just last week we watched 
All of the banks on the commitment of trades report, the swap dealers, as they're called, all of a sudden they're net long and all the hedge funds are net short. And then what happens three days later? Silver goes up a dollar. Wow, really? Okay, so I'll just turn this back to the physical accumulation part. What matters now to price is not so much physical supply and demand. That's secondary, even tertiary. It's the supply and the demand of the derivative that matters because that's what sets price and the banks manage the supply and the demand of the derivative to a large extent, okay? So until that changes, we're stuck with it. That explains the gold-silver ratio at 80 as well, okay? It's all about the supply and the demand of these derivatives. I just discussed why gold is... $800 and how higher than many generalists should think it should be. And it's because of the physical supply and the physical demand. As Andy mentioned, well, we have 237 million ounce supply deficit last year, and it's going to be probably pretty close to that this year. This is where the individual investor can really have an impact. Yeah, I mean, at the margin, each of us. But if we can keep soaking up investment demand and taking silver off the market, while industrial demand and, you know, I guess other investment demand continues to grow, eventually, as in gold, these same banks will not have the silver to flow into this derivative discovered price. Okay, for now, they do. They can match all the orders up in London and match them up in New York and everything looks copacetic. And look at that, silver has never gone anywhere for, you know, 50 years or whatever people like to say when they complain about it. But there's a point when there's not enough physical metal left. Not only does it provide a floor under price, it eventually inspires a little bit of a bank run. I mean, what and what is a bank run? A bank run is, you know, you go to your local bank and, you know, you have a million dollars there and you ask them to withdraw all of it. And they go like, oh, you don't got your million dollars here. You know, it's a fractional reserve system. They keep some of it, but they loan the rest of it out. Same thing eventually happens with silver. People, you know, they want to turn in their unallocated accounts. They want to uh, cash in. Uh, they think they can cash in their, their ETF shares or whatever. And the metal's not there. And that's what eventually implodes. And that's that tick, tick, tick Andy talked about. You know, it's a little bit Hemingway-esque, my Florida friend who's down there near the Keys uh, unwittingly kind of goes toward Hemingway, you know, about how you, uh, how do you go bankrupt slowly and all at once? Yes. The system implodes slowly and then all at once because there's just delivery fit. There's just no metal at that price. Then you got to come up with, anyway, this is a long rambling answer to what I'm basically saying is that $23 a sil an ounce silver is a steal. And you might sit on it, you know, and, and drive yourself crazy and Andy's hair will get even more gray uh, in the years to come because it may continue to just do this kind of crap. But one day it ain't going to be 23 anymore. And you're not going to be able to get your hands on any either. So if silver is your bag, man, if silver, you don't want to, you don't like gold or you can't afford gold or when you just want to get some silver, like just get some, right? Like I said, call it Miles Franklin, do whatever, get some physical silver, 23. There is a day is coming where you're not going to be able to find it at $23 an ounce. So if you can find it now, uh, go ahead and take advantage of it. Well, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. It's been an awesome conversation, very enlightening. Before I do let you both go, Craig, could you tell us about the TF Metals Report? Well, I laugh about Andy's gray hair. I got him by five years, which you'd never tell by my youthful visage. Uh, but I got my share of gray hair, too. And I have gotten all of it since I started this damn website 12 years ago, almost 13 I was like this young, you know, healthy, stress-free guy 13 years ago. Maybe other things have done it, but uh, we've been doing it 13 years now. Um, look, with everything's going on in the world, whether it's monetary policy, politically, geopolitically, and the the internet is a mean, nasty place. People don't, I mean, I can't blame it. Why would you want to interact there? Your neighbors probably don't even, you know, I mean, everybody lives in their own little bubbles, right? But we need interaction. We need to, you know, uh, have friends and talk to people and share information. And so, yeah, I provide analysis every day uh, at my site, but it's the interaction between the members and the analysis they share and the camaraderie that they share that I think is where the real value of the $15 a month is found. So at a time like this, 
I mean, I, I just can't, I, I'm just really proud of the site. And I, I, obviously I'm biased, but I can't recommend it more strongly than that. Again, 50 cents a day, uh, tfmetalsreport.com. I think anybody that joins us uh, will be glad they did. Well, I'll put a link to that in the description below. Andy, could you tell us about Miles Franklin Precious Metals? Sure. Uh, and I echo what Craig says. His information is is fantastic, especially if you want to know what's going on on, on, on Comex, if you want to know what's going on with with uh, the, the big picture. Uh, I, I uh, couldn't endorse it enough. And uh, as far as Miles Franklin is concerned, this will be our 34th year in business this February. Um, we, we just eclipsed $9 billion in sales. We've never had a customer complaint ever, not one. Now we've screwed up plenty. We make it right. We haven't had a material complaint ever. Um, and, uh, we are licensed and bonded. Maybe one of the only major precious metals companies in America that can say that our corporate office is in, in Minnesota, the only state in America that mandates it in what is a federally non-regulated industry. And to what Craig also said about communication and relationships, and couldn't agree more. Uh, relationships are what has made Miles Franklin who it is, like guys like you, and 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 discussions like this mean everything to me. It's a lonely existence for all you guys out there who have the feelings that you do, think you're alone on an island, and you know at least uh, you know the three of us get to have that moment where it's somewhat cathartic to talk it out, to, to speak to a computer screen, to see our friends across the, the globe here on the back of the screen and, and talk about it. But that is what this industry needs. And, and uh, um, so, you know, I'm certainly proud to be here with you guys and for people looking for precious metals, certainly you can go to our website um, or send us an email at info at milesfranklin.com, where our price sheet that we will email you is is far more competitive than what you'll find on our website. And it is, um, uh, we won't be undersold. I'll put it to you that way. And uh, you won't be our first customer complaint either. So that was kind of a rambling answer. But I, I just want you guys to know that I appreciate both of you, what you're doing. And I couldn't agree more about the broader sense of of this community and and we definitely don't need infighting in this community we're all pulling pulling the the same wagon and um it's just these are exciting times so hopefully we can do this again sometime real soon pick up where we left off i have a feeling before the end of the year there's going to be an awful awful lot to talk about yeah let's definitely do this again before the end of the year and uh, concur with everything you said there, Andy. It's always a pleasure to talk to both of you. Thanks once again. I'll put a link to Miles Franklin's website as well as that email address you mentioned. And uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation in the future. You've noticed a shift in the world of finance. The smartest investors in the world are no longer gambling on overvalued tech stocks. They're investing in the raw materials that power our world commodities. Now, I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years, and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. From the fuel on your car to the battery in your phone, commodities are the silent engine of the global economy. It's the raw materials like oil, gold, and uranium that power our lives and could power your portfolio. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom. My team and I have assembled a 10 chapter course to get you started on building your portfolio as a commodity investor. Everything you need to know to have a competitive advantage and an edge in this market, providing you with the skills to make informed decisions, unlocking investment opportunities most people don't even know exist. I'm Jay Martin, and this is the Commodity University. Get started today.